white songbook here. I believe Jesus saves and his blood washes whiter than snow. Now I got plenty of time to preach tonight. And my preaching tonight have to be like my Sunday school class this morning. I told him I had to have a scatter gun this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The message this morning, and we're going to continue with that, uh, the second half of it. I'm not going to re-preach the first half of it. Um, we'll just put it down as the all or nothing, second half. All or nothing, second half. And we read the uh, chapter, the first 14 verses of chapter 3 in Philippians this morning, but we're going to John chapter 15 tonight, Sister Mary. We're glad you're back. World traveler here. She's been to Italy and back, and uh, I told her, I, I don't know if she saw it or not, but I put a little note on her Facebook page. You've got to talk to me and show me and tell me what this is all, what all this is. <laughs> My sister said, Rome! Well, I knew she went to Rome. Okay, but my sister could look at her pictures and say Rome with exclamation points, but I didn't get to go to Rome like my sister did. So um, I like some update on that. But we're very glad she's made her trip and got back and they didn't hijack her plane and all that kind of stuff while she's over there. I'm just glad that we're able to be here. And I have got stuff in my pockets that I don't have to have at this moment, so I'm taking this thing off. It's hot on this platform. Oh, that's my suit, by the way. In case anybody wonders. So, how do we forget what's behind, reach forth to what's ahead, and how do we press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Which that is Philippians 3.13, but we're not going back there. We've already uh, preached on that, and we're just going to go on from here. And what, how we do that is we do this by abiding. Now, everybody knows what abiding means, right? Amen. Where do you abide? In your home. That's where you live. Abiding in Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is your home, then you're living in him. We're going to John chapter 15. We're going to read verses 
1 through 17 here. No long scripture thing. Of course, I think the scripture is more important than what I got to say anyway. So uh, going to John chapter 15, starting with verse 1 and reading through verse 17. Okay? I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, I forgot. <clears throat> if we, we are now on verse number six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word of God that can come down into our heart and our soul and our life and would speak to our hearts. And now, Lord, I pray that you would anoint us to hear what you have to say and anoint our hearts to receive that we might go forth and be doers of this word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word. You may be seated. There's some of, the, of this in this reading that I've just read to you that I want to point out a little bit about. He says, abide, 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 abideth, abide, abide, abide. Did you get the picture? Yes. Yes. If he says something once, it's important. This is God talking. If he says something twice, it's really important. But if he keeps saying it, I think he wants us to get it. Abide in me. He said, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. How many of you got Christ living within you? Hallelujah. I hope every hand goes up. Yes. Yes. I'm living for Jesus. If I'm living for Jesus, he said, if you will abide in me, I will abide in you. He, he just keeps repeating it. And he says, if ye, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. There's a whole lot of people across this nation that wants God to answer their prayer. They want God to do this for them. They want God to do this for them. They want God to do this for them. But I want to know how many of them are obeying the first half of that verse. That's right. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. We need to be doing the doing if we want to get the getting. That's right. Amen. We need to be doing what God wants us to do. Um, I really like verse number 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy 
might remain in you. He said, my joy. Jesus is the one speaking here. Of course, he's the third person of the Godhead. So it's God talking to us. But he said, my joy, my joy might remain in you. Yeah, we can have some difficulties and we can have some problems. We can have some things that just go wrong every which way. And we don't know which way to turn. But I'm here to tell you it doesn't make any difference what is happening in your life. It's the joy of the Lord, Jesus Christ, that he said he has given to us. And he wants his joy to remain in us. And why does he do that? That your joy might be full. Now, I could have brought a cup of water up here and got it full to the point of flowing over. I heard of an illustration one time where the professor put these big rocks in a glass, a, a glass container. And then he asked the students, is the, rock, is the glass full? And they said, yes. Then he picks up a bunch of little rocks. And he pours it in the container and they fall down around the big rocks. He says, now, is it full? And they all said, yes. Then he takes sand and he pours that in. And the sand goes down in amongst all the big rocks and the little rocks until it fills up to the top. And he says again, now, is it full? And they said, yes. And then he picks up a cup of water and pours in the cup of water. He wants us to have that kind of full joy. Not just a joy here and there that we can grab a hold of, but he wants us to have a joy that's going to fill us up to the overflowing. And is, is it our joy? No, it's his joy. But it's so that our joy can be full, filled up to the overflowing. And he said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So we need to be living in Christ. That's what the abiding means, living in Christ. We are walking by faith and not by sight. I use this illustration quite frequently when I'm talking about faith because a lot of times people don't understand faith. When it says we're walking by faith and not by sight, everybody in this room, to my knowledge, has got little ones of some kind around or have had in the past. And when they get ready to start to learn to walk, you hold them by the hand. Or you might hold them by the the collar of their shirt or something until they really get the hang of it. But there's going to come a time when you're going to set them out in front of you and you've got their hands on them and you're going to set them out in front of you and you're going to take your hands off. They don't know how far away you are because they're looking in front of them and they take the, you take your hands off and they have to walk by faith to that couch or that coffee table or that other person or whatever the goal is that they're headed for. And God is like that to us. Sometimes he gives us something and sets us in a place and then he takes his hands off. It's not that he's gone anywhere. It's not that he's not going to be there to help us if we stumble, but he takes his, his hands off so that we can get the feel of walking by faith faith so that you can walk by faith and he has said this this is my commandment that you love one another and if you notice he said that again in verse 17 these things I command you that you love one another when God repeats it it's important we need to set up and take notice the Holy Spirit indwelling us helps us to live and abide in Jesus Christ we need that. If we don't have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit filling us up, if we haven't been filled with the Spirit or if we've been filled with the Spirit, but it's been 40 years ago, then maybe we need another dip. Maybe we need to go back and get a refilling because we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, well, you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to talk in tongues to get to heaven. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to get to heaven. No, you don't, but it's going to make the trip going there a whole lot easier. That's right. Because the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was given to them that they could be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. It was so, to give them a power. It was to give them a holy boldness. It was to give them a fire that was burning their soul that they couldn't even stop witnessing and testifying for Jesus Christ. We need that Holy Spirit indwelling. 
We need the Holy Spirit filling us up to the overflowing so that whenever we, like I, the, the illustration I used this morning, something happens and, and, and we've got a car that's headed for our car or we got a truck. I used a truck, a trailer truck this morning. But we've got something headed for our car. We may not have time to say anything but Jesus. You need to be prayed up and, and ready to, to, to be able to speak that one word in faith believing. And then we need the reading and the studying of the word. Again and again, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if my, you keep my commandments, you've got to know his commandments. Where do we find them? In the word. So we've got to know the word. We've got to study the word. And it's not just looking at, I can read through it. I've read the Bible many times, but I can read the Bible. But every time I do, God shows me something new. Yes, amen. And I say I didn't see that before, but I know I read it because I've read the Bible all the way through multiple times. So I know I've read it before, but it just didn't look like that to me. And God was just like he's turning a searchlight on it or a, uh, a big, can't even think of the word. Anyway, strobe light, something that points that out. Um, so reading and studying the word, that helps us to abide in him. Another thing we're supposed to do is walk in holiness and righteousness. Is it our righteousness? No. Because my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And I know what we do with filthy rags in our minds. If they're not too bad, I try to wash them and clean them up. But there comes a point, there's no cleaning them up anymore. Throw them in the trash. My righteousness is like the rags I throw in the trash. The righteousness that I have in Jesus Christ is the righteousness that I have. The holiness. I'm not talking about legalism here. Somebody said something the other day. Well, what is holiness? Holiness is your heart right with God and you listening to what God says to you to do and live according to what he says to you to do. Right, amen. Okay. Verse 17. Yeah, look, let's look at verse 7 and verse 10. Both of those verses start off with a great big word. If. If you abide in me. If you abide in me. If you keep my commandments. God has got those words in there for a reason. We need to be seeking what he wants from us. He wants us to keep his commandments. He wants us to live in him and have his words abide in us. So let God's words abide in you and keep his commandments and abide in his love. Now I'll ask you another question. This is not one that you have to answer out loud. But if, if you really love somebody, and this was kind of a conversation, a little bit of a conversation on the way to church tonight, but if you really love somebody, what are you going to do? You're going to do everything you can to show them that you love them. I love my daddy, and I worked hard for my daddy. Of course, I was working for the family, and I was working for the church. It's hard work when you're doing body work on cars, right, Dan? He's just shaking his head. If you've got a, a, I guess it's about a two-and-a-half-pound sledgehammer, and you're beating on something, I don't know if I can even pick it up anymore and practice that for a while. But if you're, you're taking big old parts of a car off and you're putting other parts on and you're using the ratchets and all the wrenches and stuff to do all, it's hard work. But I did it because I love my daddy. I did it because I knew that the only way for food to be put on the table is for that car to be completely finished so that when we got it completely finished, my daddy could sell it. And it would bring money into the household and we'd have food on the table and the church lights could be kept on and the church... Uh, heat and cooling could be taken care of. But it's because I love my daddy. I did daycare at Florissant Assembly of God. Try that one for a while. Now, I did, ch I did child care in my home for a, for a small amount of kids for a long, long time. But I did daycare and I was the super, I was like the superintendent of the daycare. I was over all the other teachers and everybody. And somebody said something to me one day about that the, my job. And I said, if this wasn't ministry in the church, you couldn't pay me enough and run fast enough to get me to take this job. 
120 kids yelling and screaming and teachers complaining because they're having to do this or do that or do something else. And then you've got this teacher that's letting the kids get out of the, the fence and they wind up in the middle of the city and the police stop. And yeah, I know Sister Sharon, I'm doing this all too. And they didn't fire her. And I couldn't understand it. I wasn't there. She'd probably been fired on the spot. But they didn't fire her. I knew we needed people to take care of the kids, but they needed to take care of the kids. That's right. Like I said, if it wasn't ministry, you couldn't have run fast enough. Do you know that some of the, the results of that ministry are ministering here at this church now? Now, Sister Amy wasn't one of the kids in the daycare, but her little brother and her little sister were. And she would come in there to get them or take them out. Her mama started coming to church there because of the kids. And Amy came with them. So it was some of the witness and the testimony that brought her in. Her mom's still serving Jesus today. And I thank God for that. But it was ministry. It was ministry. It was abiding in him. It was doing what we could. It was living. And it was abiding in love. I loved those little kids. Yes, I love those kids. I had, I still got a packet that's got all of their pictures in it. I don't know that I could tell you a single one of his name anymore. But I've got a packet that's got all their pictures in it. Because I love those little kids. Of course, I know you can't tell I love kids anyway. But, um, so we got to live in Christ. Do you know you don't have to do this by yourself? I'm going to say that again. Do you know you do not have to do this by yourself? Right. Sometimes it seems like it. I'm quite sure. I'm quite sure that sometimes it just feels like that there's you, you got no hope at all and that you're doing it all alone. But you don't have to do it by yourself. It's living in Christ. And if he's the one we're living in, it's like we're the glove and he's the hand. Or we're the glove liner. Can I use that terminology? Anybody know what a glove liner is? You've got a glove on the outside. That's Jesus. The glove liner is me. And God, the Holy Spirit, is the, on the hand on the inside the glove. Yes, amen. And I just let him take me where he wants to go. I just yield myself to him and let him do it. But if I'm living in Christ, I don't have to do it alone. I don't have to do it by myself. You see, this is a race of life. And we must run it. Do we get tired? Yes, we get tired. Do we ever get discouraged? Yeah, sometimes we even get discouraged. Do we ever wish or just think, well, we might as well throw in the towel and quit? I've known some that even went that far. But let me tell you this. If we're living in Jesus Christ and we're running the race that he has set before us to run, then we keep going because he is going to give us that supernatural strength that will help us to cross the finish line. And that's what I'm all about, like I said this morning. So we've got to run with patience the race that is before us. And I think I hit on everything I wanted to in those verses of Scripture. Abide in him, live in him. It's very important. John chapter 14 Verse 11 through 17. Or maybe I'm not to that yet. Hold on a second. Let me just go ahead and read that for you. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be 
in you. This is the power of the Holy Spirit we were talking about a while ago. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So, we must run with patience the race that is set before us. We're going to Hebrew chapter 12, starting with verse number 1, Sister Mary. We've got to run with patience the race that is set before us. How many of us are patient? Brother Kendall's patient. I can tell that. I'm not the most patient person in the world. Now, I've got a little bit of patience. And my patience will go a long ways. But I'm not the most patient person. And I can get frustrated pretty easy. But he tells us to run this race with patience. Run this race with patience. Going to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And I could stop and just preach on this scripture because this is one of my favorites. Wherefore, it goes back to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the faith chapter. If you haven't read that recently, go back and read it again. And especially pay attention to the last several verses in that chapter. Because we all think about Moses as being a great man of God. And we all think about uh, Joseph being a great man of God. And we all think about uh, some of those others as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as being great men of God. But there are some of them that are unnamed. And what God says about them. Don't have time to preach that part tonight. I have no idea what time we're supposed to get out here. I think it's about 7.30, right? So I got a little bit of time. Wherefore, that means go back and those others that were talked about in the last part of that verse, that whole chapter. Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Wait a minute. It says that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. If that great cloud of witnesses is referring back to those people in chapter 11, especially those at the end of the chapter, it could be including my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, my grandmas and grandpas. It could be including a whole bunch of minister friends that I know that have gone on to be with Jesus it includes a whole bunch of people who have run the race with patience and won. See, we are compassed about. That means there's a whole bunch of them around us. Do you know when the Cardinals do their best, best ball playing? When you root for them. When they're at home. And the people in the stands are going absolutely crazy. They're down there on the field. I want you to get this picture mentally. They're down there on the field. They cannot hear and understand probably a word we're saying up there in the bleachers. But they know the noise. And here's all these people in all these seats around that stadium. Now, I haven't been to a hockey game, so I don't know about them. and I haven't done anything with soccer, so I don't know a whole lot about that. I know it's about the same way, though. But here's this bunch of people. That's who's in the grandstands. That's who's compassing us about. That's who's in the stands, and they're cheering us on. And they're saying, come on, you can make it. If I made it, you can make it. Where we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. They're there, but they're seeing us, and they're, they're saying, come on, you can do it. Run, 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 run. I was a pretty good runner. The kid took off one time on his bicycle pedaling as hard as he could. He thought he was going to get away from me. I caught him before he got to the end of the street. Run the grace. Run the race. We've got all these witnesses around us. And then the next part of that verse says, Let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I thought about packing up a couple of suitcases to where they was almost too, he too heavy to carry and carrying them in here tonight. I didn't do that. But if you're going to run a race, the only time they take extra weight and put it on their wrists and their ankles or maybe on their back is when they're practicing. Because they want to win. And they know if they practice with the extra weight on them, that they'll be able to run easier when the weights are off, when they get to the race. So, run the race with patience. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. What is the sin that probably besets us the most? Could I guess that maybe it is doubt? Unbelief? We would like to say, well, we really believe God. But too often we let doubt creep in. We, we do. We let doubt creep in. I would give you a, an acrostics for the word wait. To get rid of, this is something to get rid of. The W stands for want. The E stands for evil thoughts and evil communications. The I stands for imaginations and, super, and suspicions. The G stands for gossip. The H stands for habits that harm the body. And the T stands for things, the things that we might become obsessed with, obsession with things. Let us lay a lot aside every weight, everything that might weigh us down. My father, one time when he was preaching about the rapture, he said, the things of this world should be, you should have them as loose in your hand as one drop of water on your fingertip that you could just shake it off when the trumpet sounds. Amen. We don't want to be holding on to things down here too closely. Verse number two says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We must run the race with patience. We've got to keep going. There's no place to stop in this race. We can rest in the natural. We can have a quiet time in the natural. But we cannot stop running for Jesus Christ. This is a race and we must finish it. We've got to get rid of that weight. Anything that will slow you down. Anything that will cause you to miss the mark. Anything that would hinder your win. And don't look back. Keep going. Don't look back. Keep going. Let's look at uh, I've got 12 to 15. Hold on just a second. I had to change my paper. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight path for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but it let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be defiled. And now we've got a job to do. Don't look back. 
Keep going. Genesis chapter 19, verse 23. And I apologize, Mary, for not having this all written out for you. This is the story of Lot. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. They were taken out of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. And they had specific directions. Don't look back. Verse 23, the sun was risen again upon the earth. In other words, they've been going and going and going. They've gone all night. And the sun has risen upon the earth. It's daylight now. When Lot entered into Zoar. If you can find this on a biblical map and you do a little, you know, they've got the little scale on there that tells you about how many miles it is. And you have that from what where they think Sodom and Gomorrah was to where Zoar was, it's about 50 miles. God said, don't look back. But they've got to Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Did you listen to that? Everybody, when they read this or they talk about it, they just think the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. I want you to look at this again. It says... And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. And God spared Zoar because Lot asked for it. Verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of of salt. She almost got away. Maybe she thought that they had gotten far enough away that God didn't really mean what he said anymore. Maybe she thought, you know, it, it, it's, you know, we're safe here. We're, we're at Zohar here. And she looked back. And God turned her into a pillar of salt. We've got to keep going. Do you know that most runners, if they lose a race, lose a race because they look over their shoulder? If they stay focused on the finish line and they keep going, somebody else might pass them up. But if they pass you up, then you see that they're in front of you and you can put on the speed and go on. But if you're ahead, and there's nobody ahead of you, and you just keep running toward that goal line, you're going to win. But if you take the time to look over your shoulder, the other person has the advantage of seeing you look over the shoulder and putting on the speed and going on. We've got to run with patience. We've got to keep going. There's no place to stop in this race. We must keep going. We've got to get rid of the weight. We've already talked about that. And we don't look back. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verse 62. I always thought that this one was a little bit harsh. That's just my opinion. But then I did a little bit more adult kind of thinking. Luke 9, 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now in the natural, I know Brother Wendell's got some farm stuff up there he does. I don't know if he does plowing. But I know he's probably been around enough of it to, to know. I don't know about Brother Kendall. I don't know but. Uh, when they're plowing, 
And I learned this from my dad, mowing grass. You put your eye out there on something straight ahead. And you go straight for that goal. Because if you don't, you're going to be all over the place. If you're looking back over your shoulder to see where you have been, you're going to really be off course. God said he that puts his hand to the plow and then starts looking back. This is in life now. This is in the spiritual realm here he's talking about. If we put our hand to the plow, we say, God, I'm going to do this for you. And then we start looking back to the world and where we've been, we are not going to stay on track. And he said, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. So that we've got to say, God, forgive me for looking back and then get our eyes on the goal and on the finish line and keep on going. Don't stop. Keep on going. And don't look back. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life with thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, in the grave whither thou goest. I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. It's a race. You're running. You got to keep on running. You got to keep on running. Those who wait on God, Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31. I don't have that in front of me. I thought I did. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Maybe we're too tired to run. If you're too tired to run, walk a while. But keep going. Keep going. When I talk to Brother Dennis, he says, people probably think I'm a horrible person. I haven't been to church for a year. I said, Brother Dennis, they don't think that. They don't think that at all. And God doesn't think that either. And that's what I told him just this morning. God doesn't think that either. God knows when we can, and he knows when we can't. But if we can't run, and we can't walk, we can still wait upon the Lord. We can still renew our strength. And not only that, but we can pray for those who are doing the running and are doing the walking and those that are needing some more strength built into them. Because prayer is only hindered by our not doing it. As long as we got a mind to think, we don't even have to be able to say the words out loud. God hears the very thoughts and intents of our heart. Those who wait upon God. That's the reason why I like the eagles. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If Jesus tarries, death will come to all of us. Be it death or the rapture, we must do what we can with what we have while we still can and be ready 
when the call comes to us to meet our Lord. It's still all or nothing. When they have a runner in a race, Paul said, when they, in the natural, when they run, they have a carnal race and they run, only one gets the prize. But I'm here to tell you tonight that if we run the race, it's not going to go just to one person. I've been in many contests where somebody else won the prize. Yes, I was disappointed that I didn't win the prize. But I'm here to tell you tonight, if we run the race and we get there, we won't be disappointed. We won't be disappointed. But if we stop running the race, if we quit, if we give up, if we decide it's not worth it, and like one lady says, go back to the devil, I said, why did you, what, you want to go back to him? He's the one causing you all the trouble. That's right. Run the race. Run the race. Because we're going to win. We're going to win. And one day, we're going to be with them. Now down here, we have days and weeks and months and years. Sister Mary, I'm going to use you as an example, if that's okay. Your mama's gone on to be with Jesus. I don't know exactly how long that's been, but I know it's been a little while. But do you know that it's still today? where she is and she's watching for you. I didn't think about this till I was at a funeral recently. But in heaven, there's no time. It's day, it's today. My mama and my daddy, earth time, they've been gone for many, many, many years now. But it's today. And they're still doing like the like the, the uh, prodigal son's father. They're still watching the road, the gate. They're still watching the way to see when I come through the gate. It's today. It's today. And it may seem like a long time to us down here. If I live as, to be as old as my grandfather, I could live another 30, almost 30 years if Jesus tarried. I don't expect to live that long. But I don't think he probably did either. But even 30 years is just a few clicks in God's time. And it's today. And we're going to be with him today. One day, we'll step from this old earth to the other side. And I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day. I don't think it's going to be long. Because I believe that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. I believe that all the things that's happening around the world and around this globe, the way that they are attacking Israel right now, said it just screams, the rapture is going to take place. it got to be ready. And the one way to be ready is to abide in Jesus Christ, abide in his word, keep his commandments, and run the race. Live what he wants us to live. And be what he wants us to be until he calls us home. Until he calls us home. Father.